Hello, and welcome to today's KDP University's At Home with Lindsay Broker. Your host for today is Beth. Beth is a Senior Global Marketing Manager for KDP. She has an MFA in fiction, but has never published a book. Prior to joining Amazon, Beth worked in public health and as a program developer for patient advocacy networks. In 2016, Beth published an essay in Litro Magazine about suffering panic attacks while aiming for artistic perfection. Her current reading list is compromised of Sesame Street books that she reads to her one-year-old daughter. And as awesome as Beth is, and trust me, she's awesome, we're here to talk about Lindsay. Lindsay Broker writes science fiction and fantasy and has been on the USA Today bestseller list and sold more than 2 million books, and many of them through Amazon's KDP platform. She grew up in the Seattle area and now lives in Bend, Oregon, and she's been making up stories and writing since she was a kid. But it took her a while to get serious about learning the craft and finishing things. Today, she's several series and more than 60 novels published. Welcome, Lindsay and Beth. Thanks, everyone. Great to have you here. Thanks for everyone who uh, got up early or stayed up late to uh, make it live to the webinar. Fantastic. Thank you, Lindsay, so much for giving us your time this morning. I'm really excited to get the opportunity to talk with you. Um, as Tricia said, uh, we have so many of your fans who have joined us uh, and have submitted some really stellar questions. So we're going to try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, but uh, again, our apologies if anybody doesn't get their, their specific question answered. Um, if you're okay, we'll, we'll dive right in. I know it's uh, early in Bend, Oregon as well, um, but we'll just go ahead and get started. Can you tell us a little bit about when you decided that being an author was your calling? I always loved making up stories. I was an only child and I, I my mom taught me to read early, I think, so I would have something to do so I didn't pester her all the time. So I was just, I loved writing from an early age, read tons, but I was also kind of told the implication was, well, you can't make a living as a writer, you know, not a fiction anyway. So, you know, you should study computer science or, you know, business or something like that. So I, I went more that direction, but I, I always loved it and was always starting things. And yeah, eventually I just was like, I'm going to finish, you know, and I found online writing workshops and that was really encouraging because I saw other people were, you know, putting their stuff out there and finishing it. And some of them were getting agents. This was sort of in the early 2000s. So a little bit before self-publishing was actually doable. But um, as I fin I'd finished two novels uh, and I was getting really serious as an query agents and, and get going, even though I didn't think I was really writing the kind of stuff that they'd want. <laughs> I didn't see a lot of uh, traditional publishers putting out my sort of Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> inspired fantasy at the time. And um, in fall of 2010, I got my first Kindle. And then that led me to kind of look and I found out, wow, it's actually really easy just to put your stuff out there right now. And uh, J.A. Conrath was blogging back then. He was kind of one of the first guys showing his numbers, like this is how much I'm making, <laughs> you know, and he had a huge backlist and everything, but I was super inspired and almost right away I decided, you know, I'm just gonna, just gonna do it. And here we are like 10 series and, and 60 novels later. And this is my full-time job now, wow. it's super cool. That's that's awesome. Um, thank you for sharing that. I, again, a lot of uh, our audience today are fans of yours. For those who are less familiar with your work, can you share what genre you you write? You sort of mentioned Dungeons and Dragons as an inspiration. Um, what what genre genre do you primarily write in? Yeah, I, I started mostly in fantasy, kind of a mashup of maybe steampunk, epic fantasy. I didn't really know then about categories on Amazon and, and trying to write things that maybe fit in one of those categories. And then I also was a huge um, Star Trek fan as a kid and Buck Rogers, watched all the reruns and stuff with my mom. So loved sci-fi and eventually started doing that too. And I have a couple of finished sci-fi series now. We're almost finished. I'm working on the last book and the most recent one. So I, I jump around within sci-fi and fantasy, but mostly stick to that. I have a follow-up from one of your fans on that, which is that writing in multiple subgenres. So you have sort of a sci-fi series and, and, and several fantasy series. Um, do you find that you feel like you're writing for two different groups or do you feel like you're, you have one big fan base that you write for? 
I am fortunate to have some readers that will follow me through both. And I think I kind of write the same types of quirky characters and a lot of banter and sort of fun dialogue, no matter what I'm writing. So I, I think that I have a lot of people that just enjoy either one. But I, I certainly have people that say, no, you know, I, I don't do that fantasy stuff. We only do sci-fi, no magic. Uh, so you do, if you're going to write in two different genres, you kind of have to be prepared to think, well, I'm going to have to build two different fan bases. And anybody that comes mm -hmm. over, awesome. But you do, it's, it is a little more work for yourself. It's easier road if you're the kind of person that just, this is what I love, you know, and I'm going to stick with it. It's a little easier. Yeah. Um, maybe some wishful thinking from one of your fans, but um, are, do you have any plans uh, to try your hand at lit RPG or literary role playing games? I was actually really excited when that became sort of a new, you know, it's not a category on Amazon yet as we record this, but, you know, there's definitely, there's people lit RPG, they put it in their book titles and they're doing super well. Um, there seems to be a big hunger for it. And, and that's sort of the, uh, and I was a big gamer. I kind of had to put it aside to get serious about writing and start finishing things. But I, I mm -hmm. grew up with like the BBS dialing up on the modem, you know, to play the MUDs and later EverQuest and World of Warcraft. So I, I certainly considered it. I'm a little bit intimidated because apparently the fans of that particular subgenre really want like stats of the weapons and they want to see the character advancing through the levels and gaining more powers. And I'm not sure that this is a little rigid for me. I never, you know, I've played Dungeons and Dragons and all that and I never cared that much about the stats. I just wanted to make up the stories and have fun. So I won't say never, but maybe not. It might be a little portal fantasy or something a little less uh, defined. So not so wishful thinking, but maybe maybe on the um, less technical side of uh, stats, uh, some lit RPG would be coming from you. That's great. Um, with 60 novels, a, a hard question to, to answer, but who is your favorite character that you've written and what do you love about them? This kind of changes every year with whatever series I'm working on. And I have a lot of characters and, you know, after you write maybe eight novels with someone, you do sort of kind of fall for them. And some have even gone into spinoff series. Uh, I'm going to go, set, go ahead and say right now from my sci-fi series that I'm about to finish up, uh, the character is Professor Kazmir Dabrowski, and he's a quintessential geek. He's a robotics professor, but he gets swept up in this big galactic, you know, war, basically, or they're on the brink of war, and he just has to become like this leader. And he's such a, uh, not quite pacifist, but he never shoots anybody throughout the whole series. He's a little bit MacGyverish, always wants to solve problems by either negotiating or, you know, building something, something creative that will uh, allow their side to uh, to come out ahead. And you know, I just, he's actually nothing like me. I'm a little more pessimistic and he's super optimistic. And that's maybe why it's been fun to write. And I wish we had more people like that in leadership positions uh, in our world right now that wanted to, you know, peaceful solutions, creative thinking, wanting everybody to come out happy. Um, so he's been a fun character to explore. That's great. Um, maybe on the opposite side of, of the most peaceful characters, we do have a question from one of your fans, which is, can you name your favorite dragon? Um, I think I've done a few now. Dragons have sort of become a thing for me. <laughs> uh, there's one in my Dragon Blood series who is named Rava Saruth, and he thinks he's a god and that humans should worship him and bring tarts and other things as uh, offerings to his temple that he now has by the end of the series. So he's just a really big, goofy, atypical dragon. So I've had a lot of fun with him. <laughs> That's great. That's a great answer. Um, you've also written uh, significantly uh, about uh, autistic or introverted characters. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the research that you've done around that and if it's something that you hope to return to in future series? So there's not a whole lot of research because it's very much a writing what I know thing when I do those kind of characters. I have, I do have a, a beta reader friend who is a little more uh, card carrying, got the Asperger's diagnosis when she was really young. Um, I think I missed that in the 80s and I was just kind of a quiet, good student and they tended to only look for things if you were a troublemaker or you know, not doing well in school. So I do kind of, I run things by her. I'm like, does this seem legit? Because she's way more dialed into the community uh, than I am. So, um, and then, you know, I, I've kind of looked online like, okay, get all the, some of the traits, There's, you know, because it's, it's uh, with autism, it can be very different from person to person. So you don't want to stereotype either. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I actually have more trouble doing the really extroverted, <laughs> outgoing, neurotypical characters. That's why I say so many of my characters are quirky, even if they're not supposed to be autistic or anything. They're just, they end up being not quite your normal person, I would say. Sure. Um, that it, I really appreciate uh, you sharing that, and um, I know your fans really appreciate um, just the, the depth of characters that, that you've included in those novels. Um, what uh, sort of switching to the to the publishing side and, and more around the business of, of publishing? Um, what's something that you wish people knew uh, about uh, self publishing or, or or being an indie author? I think that. I just want folks to know that if you actually want to make money from it and do it as a career, it's very much a, a long road. You know, I, I and I felt the same way when I was starting. You feel like it's such a huge victory to finish your first novel, and it totally is. I can't tell you how many I started and you know got thirty thousand words into and just abandoned and forgot about. But um, that's only the first victory. If you want to sell books, you have to be prepared. There's so much to learn now. And but um, on the other hand, you can put it out there and see what happens. You know, it's very much, you can just learn a little bit as you go. That's been my path. So mm -hmm. if you want to make money, a lot to learn, a lot to do, and it probably won't be your first book or your first series. It does super well. Every now and then lightning strikes, but that's atypical. So I just be prepared, lot, lots to do, lots to learn. And I always plan, you know, some people think I'm going to write one book and retire. You know, here I am 60 novels later and I'm not retired yet, <laughs> making progress, but, um, yeah, if you want to do it as a career. We actually had a couple of follow-up questions about your productivity schedule. I mean, 60 books is a huge number of, of novels, um, and you are a very prolific writer at this point. Can you share with us a little bit about your writing routine? How are you so productive? Um, do you work on more than one novel at once, or do you set up writing time every day? How do you, how do you structure your writing life? I do like to tell people to, for inspiration that it did take seven years to finish the first novel that I actually published. That wasn't necessarily working the whole time. Those were also the World of Warcraft years, so there were some distractions. But um, it's very much been a, a kind of gradual process. Um, you know, first novel, you're really, you know, I was going chapter by chapter through a workshop and getting feedback, and I was also critiquing other people, uh, their novels, and learning a lot that way. Um, you know, but by the time you get to about the 10th novel, maybe it's a little more, you sort of have internalized the rules and writing structure, plot structure. So it, it becomes a little smoother. Uh, there was less, like the first two novels I wrote, I totally ended up rewriting like the last third from scratch because both of them, I didn't like the endings. So that's very normal. Um, these days, it's almost, it's, I don't want to call it a factory. <laughs> that seems so unartistic, but it's very much a production process. Um, I, when I'm writing the first draft, you know, I'll take a day and kind of outline the story. Usually I've been kind of thinking about the next story while I was writing the last one. So I already have ideas and, um, you know, I outline just kind of chronologically go through this is going to happen, this chapter, this chapter. And it doesn't stick to that, but by having that framework there, I find that very helpful. Uh, I did pants my way through my first series, so there's nothing wrong with that. I just found that outlining made me more efficient and um, less likely to have to like rewrite scenes and cut things later on. So, you know, I do the outline, then I start writing and, you know, I start out, my first goal is just a thousand words a day when I was still working full time, uh, not as a writer or not as an author. And then gradually I kind of got to the point where I was making enough that I wanted to transition and I, my goal was 3000 words a day. And then I heard other people that were writing like, uh, Rachel Aaron has a great book, if you haven't read it, called 2K to 10K, how she really increased her output to write more in the same time. And that was inspiring. So I got to the point where I could do 10,000 words a day on the rough draft. And now I'll do like seven to 10. 10 is usually like I'm pushing, I have a deadline with my editor coming up. Seven's a little more leisurely. So it, depending on the length of the novel, a couple, two to three weeks to finish, uh, something really long, like my sixth Star Kingdom book was over 150,000 words. So that took, was closer to two months, especially when it gets more complicated with the plot and a lot of POVs too, I'll, I tend to slow down a little bit. But uh, once I do the rough draft, I do, you know, sometimes I make notes to myself. I write all the way through without going back to edit anything. I, I won't even, I'll just put in like a note to myself if I have to look up a name or research something later. 
And then on the editing pass, you know, I've got my notes and I'm looking for things and I'll edit and I'll fix things and add whatever I need to do. If I had to research something, I'll work that in. After I do one pass, I send it to my beta readers. And then usually while they have it, I'm kind of getting started on the next thing. And so a week or two later, mm -hmm. they send it back and I, um, whatever comments, if they make stuff that, um, you know, they fix typos and things like that, but also sometimes it'll be like, well, you know, this this love scene, which is not my strength, <laughs> even though I, I like to usually have a romance in this series, like writing anything gooey, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> so I have a one beta reader who says, well, you know, let's maybe work on that a little bit. Um, and then after I go through and do that, I send it to my editor editor who, you know, kind of does the line stuff and any rearrange any rearrangements or sentences that don't make sense usually my writing's fairly clean at this point uh thanks to having done the workshop and you know sort of learning the ins and outs of most of the grammar stuff um so and then she sends it back and by this point i'm probably done with the rough draft for the next one and i have at this point i have typo hunters too i send early copies of the book too because as i found early on you think it's edited and then there's still there'd be like 50 things throughout the course of the manuscript that just nobody saw. So the typo hunters have really helped me clean it up to a better degree so that I don't get those little uh, notes <laughs> from Amazon. Of, Somebody's flagged an error that you need to go attend to uh, <laughs> nearly as often anymore. And then I ready to kind of get into the marketing side and publish it. Thank you so much for walking us through that. It is, um, I, I think, really fantastic for a lot of our aspiring authors um, who are, you know, either uh, publishing their second or third novels or who are working on that first novel. Um, if you had to sum up your experience as an independent author um, in, you know, a, the, it, I know it's a long journey, but um, just in the short time that we do have, uh, what would you tell people about being an independent author? I think it's great that you get to call all the shots. I didn't realize until I started doing it how much like I wanted to pick the cover art and I wanted to be able to tell the editor, no, I'm, I'm not fixing that. That's dialogue. I want that to be not grammatically correct. And uh, just handling the marketing and seeing the um, sales come in real time so you can actually tell like did the promotion I did today, did it actually sell books? Where, whereas with traditional publishing, you're waiting six months to get your royalty statement and who knows where those book sales came from. So I, I found that the control and, you know, not having to have so much patience, I, I, you know, I'm glad now that I didn't go the traditional way because I can't even imagine having to wait two years to see your book published and still being excited at that point about promoting it. Because I think of stuff I did two years ago and I'm like, oh man, I barely remember the names of those characters at this point because I'll be working on another series. So it's great for, con I won't say control freaks, but people who like control. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, when did you first realize that you could do it full time, that you could make this your, your full time job? So I didn't have anything hit big right up from the beginning. I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I would pick it up pretty easily because before this I did like websites and content marketing for the web and I knew a little bit about search engine optimization, but publishing is a whole different world. And also back then there were you know, this was December 2010 when I published my first novel. There weren't really as many uh, advertising opportunities. So you're kind of putting it out there mm -hmm. like, how the heck do I promote this? I, I remember starting my Facebook page reluctantly because I'm not a huge social media person just by nature. But I'm like, I got to do this author Facebook page. And you know, so um started doing that stuff, but it was about the fifth or sixth book in that series, The Emperor's Edge was my first series, and I'd written a couple novellas and short stories on the side that I I learned how to make the first book free, which was, you know, less obvious, and it, you had to sneakily make it free everywhere else, and then Amazon would price match maybe eventually. Um, as we record this now, you can actually email them and ask. You, mm -hmm. you still have to have it free elsewhere, because it's a price matching thing, but... um. So I learned how to make the first one free and then you know enough people downloaded it and I, I did try to do my little bits to promote it that they were buying the rest of the books in the series and I think they were $3.99 or so then. And by the time I got to about the sixth one, fifth or sixth one, you know, I was reaching the income, like the best I'd ever made on my day job before that. And I kind of had a number in my head and I thought, well, if I can just make this much every month and not drop below that, this can be my new full-time income. 
and it's you know seven years later and I haven't dropped below that so it's been a really cool wow. it's, it's really the dream job I mean the marketing is all that is not so much my favorite thing but I've, I've learned enough and we actually have a podcast where we interview people who are really good at like Facebook ads or Amazon ads oh, cool. and I am not naturally but I try to learn what I can and I, I've learned enough to uh, help sell the books so that's that's awesome. We have some marketing questions that, that we'd love to get into with you as well. And um, I, I love that you have a podcast where you're learning from other authors for that. That's a that's a fantastic thing. Um, I, I do have a quick question for you. Um, I know, uh, as you said, you, you don't so much like the intro, uh, the extroverted parts of, of being an author necessarily, but um, you do have a really unique view of bestseller lists. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you first learned that you had made the USA Today bestseller list? Right. I, you know, having always been online, I never paid attention to newspaper bestseller lists, and I, I still don't. <laughs> so it, it seems like a little bit of a relic of a pastime. Uh, I've always just been like, I want to sell books and make money, <laughs> and that's the priority. But I remember it was actually 2014, and through no like brilliance of my own, I had like a 99 cent box set and I got a book bub on it. And that one particular series, this is my Dragon Blood series, just really hit more than my other stuff. And, you know, I think it sold about 6,000 some copies this week in January. And I was like, well, that's great. Now they're going to read the rest of the series. So that's all I was thinking. But then in um, about April, somebody on Kboards, which is a self-publishing forum or just a Kindle forum, and there's a self-publishing part of it but he's like yeah guys I did this USA Today run and I these are all the things I did to sell my book you know this many copies in a week and I made the list and I was like I I think I sold that many copies in January so I went back digging through the archives I was like yeah there it was I actually had made their list uh, with that box set um, and you recently started a new series, uh, the the Death Before Dragons series um, with Sinister Magic. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that series and, and um, sort of what uh, readers can expect? Yeah, I should be plugging the current new series, shouldn't I? See, I'm not very <laughs> natural at the marketing stuff. Like, here's the link, guys, go buy it. Um, but the uh, the new series, Death Before Dragons, is an urban fantasy, and that was actually a new subgenre of fantasy for me. I usually do sort of the high fantasy, make up the world. Same with this sci-fi, but I, the character, main character Val is a. I, she came to me first. That's sort of how series launch for me is. I get the main character, and then I think, well, based on who they are and what they want, what kind of stories are going to work for them, and I just I envisioned her as this uh, half elf kind of an assassin of magical bad guys who works for the government and she's like climbing down a cliff and I, I just had her envision her getting a call from her doctor because she's like in her 40s she's a uh, divorced has a teenage daughter that she starts a series estranged from basically and um so she, I just knew this was like a modern character and uh, her doctor's recommending she have therapy because she has all these issues <laughs> and I just like okay I have to do this in a contemporary setting it's not going to make sense in you know historical fantasy kind of setting uh, so from that point this series just kind of grew on that. And I brought in the dragons because they've been good to me in the epic fantasy stuff. And, you know, I, I, I know it's not like a hugely popular trope in urban fantasy, but I, I saw enough of them. They're like, well, readers will probably read about dragons in this setting. Why not bring them to Earth? Yeah. So, you know, the series is dragons have returned to Earth for the first time in a thousand years and she's figuring out why. And there's been all these uh, magical beings kind of taking refuge here, uh, elves and dwarves and that sort of thing. And um, so she gets wrapped up in dragon politics, which she has no interest in and because they're super powerful beings. And as strong as she is at fighting, you know, your common bad guys, she has to deal with these guys that can just kind of wave their hand and, or wave their tail <laughs> and uh, freeze her and she can't do anything. So. It's, it's a fun series. There's a lot of humor. She's a very sarcastic heroine. She gets to say all the things I wish I could, you know. So uh, if anybody wants to check it out, it, it's I think it's pretty fun. When I was prepping for this interview, I, I read that you were writing, you know, some um, fantasy in modern space. And um, I love the phrase dragon politics. That is, I, I think, maybe my new favorite writer phrase. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, we did have a quick follow-up from one of your fans uh, who, who is working on, on a novel themselves. Um, when do you know, so you talked a little bit about you started with the main character and you knew that that's where the series was going to start. When do you know that the book is done? How do you know 
that that part of the story is finished. So there's always, you know, if you go looking at plot structure, there's sort of a rising tension. I'm drawing a, uh, a mountain, <laughs> if anybody's listening to the audio later and can't see that. So you're kind of always building towards a conflict and a big climactic ending. So when you get to that point, you should be near the end of the story. Everything should have been building to that point. And I'm a person who loves my epilogues and that kind of thing. So I will often have a little bit of a denouement and then maybe an epilogue. But if it's continuing to ramble on beyond that point, maybe, you know, you could actually cut that and make it like bonus extras. Um, readers love like a second epilogue or, or bonus scenes. But uh, you shouldn't have a whole lot more after you get to that final conflict. That's a, that is really practical advice. That's really great advice. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple more questions for you around some of your experiences that, that we think other authors may benefit from. Um, I, I think you actually just gave some really great advice, but what other advice uh, would you have for either an aspiring or a new uh, KDP author? Well, I think I, I love series. It's everything is much easier if you write in a series. I, I know people would sometimes like to do standalone stories, but it's a tougher road because when you write in a series, everything you can just focus on selling one book, book one. And then assuming you write a story that people want to continue reading, they're going to come along for the journey. And also your income gets a little more predictable if you start to see like, well, every time I put out a new installment in this series, X people go and buy it. So it's not, you're not starting new every time. So that's one thing. If, if it at all works for your genre, and even you'll see this in romance, even though um, each book is like a new couple usually in romance and a new happily ever after or happily for now, you'll see that the authors will seed in in the first book, like some side characters that are very interesting and you kind of want to see their romances too. And so book two will be one of those side characters and it, maybe it's set in the same small town or uh, the same space station if you're doing sci-fi romance or something. So I think series makes it easier and then just being prepared to learn. There's so many great podcasts out there now, and it's great that you guys have started this series. I, I was just listening to Joshua Delzell's interview. It was up a couple weeks ago. So there's there's so much out there now to learn. We were a little fumbling in the dark in 2010. There was sort of the Keyboards Forum that I mentioned <laughs> earlier, and I don't think um, Joanna Penn had the Creative Pen podcast, but I think she was just a little more just starting to explore the self-publishing stuff. So um, there's just so much out there that you can be walking the dog and just listening or, you know, going to the gym. If you're allowed to go to the gym, we're recording this and <laughs> still locked down some places for coronavirus. So just absorbing everything you can. But at the same time, don't get too wrapped up in the marketing stuff. Finish the book first, you know, focus on that and then figure out how to market it. That's really good. Uh, I, I appreciate you calling that distinction between, you know, finishing the title and, and then, um, you know, moving in towards your towards your marketing space. What marketing tactic do you feel has been the most successful for you? So I've never had any hang ups about like the value of my work being reflected by the price of it, because as a kid, I just devoured books from the library. And so they were free, essentially. And that didn't mean I love them any less than if it were ten dollars. I didn't have ten dollars. then, so <laughs> thank goodness for the library. So I have always been willing to give away my first book free, run sales, you know, maybe do ninety nine cent launch of the first book in the series and, and then going to full price later so I can make a good income. But I still find that that works, whether it's um, just having something permanently free everywhere or doing if you're in KDP Select, doing like the free days every quarter that you get. Uh, it can be a great way to just get people who wouldn't necessarily try a series because maybe, especially if you're like me and you're um, not super writing like what's really popular and what's going to sell. Like if that thing, if there's a book like that, people are just going to buy it because they you know, love that. Uh, if you have a free something that's a little out there, a little, you know, I use my dill, pit, dill pickle potato chips analogy <laughs> that people got to try that maybe before they fall in love with that. They're not just going to grab it off the shelf. So I, I always willing to give away the free samples to try to lure. I, I appreciate that. That's a, that's a really good analogy. As yes, so I write dill pickle potato <laughs> chip books. <laughs> I write dill pickle potato chips and, and dragon politics. That's amazing. That's great. Um, uh, how much time do you feel like you spend thinking about the marketing compared to how much time you spend writing? 
I, you know, you'll hear this expression that the best marketing you can do is writing the next book. And there's some truth to that. I, I really focus. I mean, that's why I'm so prolific because that's my favorite kind of marketing is just writing the next one in the series. And to some extent that will help sell not only the early book in the series, if somebody sees like book seven and it's ranking in the top 100 for space opera or whatever your genre is, they may go check out book one. And also I find that once people finish the series that I'm, they're reading, they'll often go back and check out my older stuff. So the front list mm -hmm. sells the back list sort of to some extent. But um, I also, I certainly try to, when I launch a new series, especially give the books a really as good of a shot as I can. So I'm, you know, I'm starting to put out teasers for things. I'll often write like little bonus scenes or a short story or like a prequel novella that I'm going to make for free either on my website or to newsletter subscribers as a bonus for like here, sign up to my newsletter and you can get this novella from this other point of view character that you don't get to see in the main series. So I, I do a lot of extra things around a, a series at the launch to try to, because I, I don't like to assume that just because people read my other series, they're going to read the new one. Some do, and that's awesome, but I always, every new series is a chance to start from scratch and maybe get some new readers along the way. So I, I around launch time, I, I definitely focus more heavily on the marketing. Maybe I, you know, there's a week where I'm not doing any writing or editing, but then once things are rolling, I tend to just go back into writing mode. I'm happiest, my happiest days are like just sitting with the dogs on my lap on the couch and writing and I don't have any appointments or anything. That's sort of my favorite types of days as a writer. You, you touched on this a little bit, but do you take special effort to prepare for a book launch rather than the sort of everyday part of your marketing? Can you walk us through how you get ready uh, for a launch like uh, like Sinister Magic? So I do, like I said, I, um, I've been working on bonus scenes for this one and I had a, a kind of a novelette, I guess you'd call it, I wrote for this one and that's up on my website now. And so people can read that. It works as a standalone story like I never want to do a cliffhanger thing. Um, I will also put up like here's the first two chapters of the book just so people can read it. With They know going in like oh, I'm going to have to buy the book if I want to read the rest. But I like to give them a complete experience, really introduce the characters to them. So hopefully they want to know how do these characters meet, you know, or find out a little bit more about them. So stuff like that. And then I do the typical um, uh, as you're getting ready, I'll, I'll usually do a short pre-order. Um, like right now, I'm I'm launching my new series into Amazon uh, KDP Select, so it's just Amazon for to focus on for the beginning, and then maybe a couple weeks of a pre-order so that I can get the link and I know everything's uploaded and it's smooth, and then I can submit the link to uh, you know whatever. Uh, I still use the promo sites like um, there's e-reader e -reader news today um, and Sci-Fi Fantasy Book Barbarian. Um, New in Books, which is the guys that also do Bargain Booksy and Free Booksy, they have a launch, you know, kind of launching a new book promo. So I'll book that stuff because I've got the pre-order link, so that makes that easy. And then I'll start, like I said, the earlier. I'm not the best at Amazon ads, and I found that with pre-orders, pre they don't tend to convert quite as well as when somebody can just buy the book. I, I think, you know, <laughs> I'm the same way as a reader. I'm like, oh, I don't want to pre-order this. <laughs> I just want it now. But I, I do find that I can sell some pre-orders, and it gives me a little time to tinker with the Amazon ad copy and see sort of like, this one looks like it's converting better than with the others. So when the book actually goes live, I can, you know, throw more money into that particular one that I saw was doing well during the pre-order period. And then, of course, I do the social media announcements, um, and I usually email my mailing list maybe on day two. There's kind of the advice is that you should try to stagger everything over a couple of weeks so that you're not just boom, you know, here's 2,000 sales <laughs> on one day because Amazon will sort of it's sort of, we call it the book bub effect where you sell a whole bunch of books at once and it used to you'd be hang out there at the top of the rankings for a while, but then it changed. And now you tend to start trickling downward again if you have a sudden spike. So with the launch, if you can, and it's tough when you have a bunch of readers that are just waiting for the new book to come out, but to the extent that you can sort of make the launch last over a week or two uh, with ads and staggering when you announce everything that can sort of help maybe keep it selling a little longer and we always uh, hope to you know we talk about the Amazon algorithms you know if you can tickle the the algorithms just right it might stick in the store I think that's really more just like that particular book is um, 
appealing to more people. So when they see it, that's like their jam. Those books are just always going to be easier to make sticky and keep selling. But we all dream that we'll have the book that just magically keeps selling by itself for months and months at a, at a high level. So that's the hope. Lindsay, I want to say thank you for the really practical advice that you're giving here. I mean, really, um, I, I think it's a it's a fantastic um, opportunity for our audience to, to learn a little bit more about sort of the way that you are attacking this. And I want to thank you both for your transparency on that, but also just having really practical uh, tips here. It's, it's awesome. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, you talked about um, sort of pre-order, um, but is there a tool that you as a writer really can't live without? Something that you absolutely, you think, you know, it, indie publishers need a certain set of tools. So my two favorite ones are just using Scrivener for the writing process. I like everybody pretty much. I started with Word and I was so excited when I opened up Scrivener. I saw it shows you all the scenes, all the chapters over on the side. You can have all your character sheets right there. Down in the research, I usually build a, make a story Bible so that I can like write things down as I create them. Uh, you know, sci-fi and fantasy, you're often like making up religions and making up whole worlds and species. <laughs> so you got to keep notes. And I appreciate that Scrivener makes it easy to just access everything Thing and you know really jump around uh, when I did it all in Word we just I remember trying to make my own table of contents you know 2005 or something whatever this was and you could do it but it wasn't as easy uh, so Scrivener is a great tool for writing uh, for formatting ebooks um, and also paperbacks if you want to do it yourself I, I use Vellum which is sort of a Mac tool so I don't know what to recommend what the best thing is for PC people right now, but that's, you can just drag your cover art and your Word document or whatever you, you're working in uh, into the file, into Vellum, and it makes an ebook basically. There's very little to do. Because when I started, I, I paid someone else to do my formatting and then you would find like, oh, we found three typos or, oh, I want to update the back matter because the next book in the series is available and I want to link to the next book. And it becomes more tedious if you have to go back and forth and pay someone every time you want to do that. So um, Vellum is a, is a great tool. Any, you know, and there's other formatting tools out there. That, that is one thing I recommend. You either do it yourself or you kind of you have someone in house that's doing it for you, an assistant or something that's uh, can update things quickly. As far as all the marketing stuff goes, there's tools out there. Um, there is one I have called Publisher Rocket. Dave Chesson uh, has runs that one and that allows you to kind of look up and see which keywords people are typing like when they type into the search box on Amazon uh, maybe they're typing in like space opera with strong female protagonist <laughs> like things you wouldn't necessarily uh -huh. guess beyond the uh, you know simple stuff that you can think of and, and that kind of lets you see both how how many people are searching for that monthly and how competitive it is so like if something's super competitive mm -hmm. you might you'll end up on like page 30 of the search results. So nobody will ever find your book that way. So that's that's one tool I, I use. And that's about it, honestly. Um, there's other marketing stuff you can buy. I don't use any of it, I don't think. Um, I use, a, there's a service called Kalytics uh, by Alex Newton and he does kind of, he researches what's trending in the Amazon store. And if you're gonna publish a lot and publish in a lot of genres, that can be useful. He sort of shows like new categories and he does reports on, like he did one on urban fantasy, you know, and I went in and looked like, and he was, there's like a cloud where he shows like the most popular um, words and titles in like the top 100 bestsellers in urban fantasy. And you like say, oh, magic is like really big in titles. I was like, okay, I'm gonna work magic into the title of my first book. <laughs> <laughs> so you can really go down a rabbit hole following that stuff. And I don't certainly don't think it's necessary for, you know, if you're doing your first book, you can worry about that later <laughs> with the next series. I appreciate that. Um, that I, again, thank you for the, the practical uh, input and advice on that. And you're right. There is a, uh, a huge, uh, you know, number of things you could be using. And so, um, you know, really uh, nice to, to learn a little bit more about what you find useful. Um, I did actually have a question for you about covers um, and it comes from, comes from our audience. Do you track what other either sci-fi or fantasy writers are doing on their covers? Do you feel like you need to make your cover look a certain way for fans to recognize it? 
I do now. In the beginning, I didn't really know. And in the beginning, in 2010, there weren't a whole, there wasn't a whole this industry built up on supporting indie authors. So you had to go on to like DeviantArt or something and find an illustrator. And then you would realize they had no experience with like the right fonts and things to use on to make it look like a book. So my my first covers were not nothing great. And you know, it's still been a bit of a struggle. That's not the most natural thing for me. I don't think I have that artistic eye. So I'm trusting other people to some extent, but I have learned that the more you can look like an appropriate, you know, let's say you're doing space opera and you see ships are really big in the space opera category. Sometimes there's like a cool bounty hunter dude on like the, like the Mandalorian kind of look, you know, so the desert behind him and, and that can work too. But the further you get away from what's working, the more of a risk it is. Uh, that people won't look at the book and know right away this is for me you know if you see a spaceship on the cover you're like well that's probably space opera or maybe military sci-fi especially if there's a battle so the more you can tell the reader right away that this book is for them before they read the blurb before they sample it or anything the more likely you're just going to kind of get that interest and bring someone in and it's not that you can't do other things but i've kind of found and it's a little sad truth that <laughs> people kind of want more of the same but different so you know it being completely different might just make them pass over your book. What was most surprising to you about self-publishing your books? What did you never expect that has now become part of your everyday? You know, I think that um, I, I made a note for this question just to say how easy it is to actually publish your book after, you know, reading, you know, I was studying how to get an agent and that would take years <laughs> to get a traditional publisher and that would take years. So I was quite delighted when the first time I take my little Moby file, you know, and put it up on Amazon and it was a digital text platform that Amazon DTP and now we've got Amazon KDP and it's just like a two, it was a two page wizard. I think now it's expanded to three pages, but it's super simple. I mean, I don't even think it takes five minutes to actually upload your book. And usually within a day at the most, it's it's up in the store. So that's super great for all you people with like me with no patience. But um, I think what's been, what I didn't really think about was just uh, how much interaction you can have now with the readers and how bolstering that can be. Like I, I tend to, I try to be like a really practical business, like, okay, this series is making this much money and therefore it's worth doing two more books in it. But you're certainly affected by knowing that people are reading your books and really enjoying your characters. So I've, I, I was kind of a social media hater and I still don't use it a lot for just personal stuff. <laughs> I do like three updates a year on my personal page, but it's been a neat way to interact with a bunch of people who are kind of like you because they if they like your reading you've got something in common if, if they like your writing so that's been kind of a pleasure too and I actually love the, the social media over email because with email you can only answer one person at a time and um, that can be nice sometimes but it's great to be able to put stuff out for like here's a hundred people that are going to see this so I've uh, surprisingly become a Facebook user <laughs> We do have a, a, a um, question here uh, about whether or not you use all social media channels, but it sounds like Facebook is is primarily what you use. You don't Instagram and tweet and TikTok and whatever else. I am on Twitter. That was the first thing I joined because I wanted to stalk agents. So I've been there for like 10 years. My handle is Goblin Writer because at the time I wasn't thinking I have to create a professional author thing with my name on it. And I actually have goblins for the first time in the new um, Death Before Dragon series. So once again, 10 years later is ap actually applicable. <laughs> but um, so I'm on there. I have not noticed that it sells a whole lot of books. I have followers on there that are readers and, you know, maybe a few books there. Um, so and then I'm on Instagram. I recently joined that one because people are like, mm -hmm. oh, you got to be on Instagram. But I don't. It's more like, oh, I if I find something cool to take a picture of, there's a lot of my dogs on Instagram. Um, I will just share that or if I, you know, the artwork for the new books I'll put up there and it's been easy to get followers, but that's probably because I already have a fan base at the, at the point when I joined it. But I found that Facebook, uh, you know, it seems to be, I think my demographic of readers is probably thirties and up and that they seem to, I mean, everybody's on Facebook almost. Uh, YA readers, maybe not so much, but the sort of uh, Gen X boomers are all on Facebook right now. And, um, so when I joined and made my author page, I still remember somebody made the comment like, oh, finally you're here because they're on there anyway. So you might as well post stuff so that they'll, they'll see it. And I found that my Facebook page has become my number two 
like the, when I post a link to the new new book, it's my number two after my newsletter as far as how many books I actually sell from that one thing. So it's become worth it for me to, I don't take a lot of time. I'll post like snippets of books I'm working on there. Sometimes I just post fun dragon things or robot things. My sci-fi series was big on the, with the robot assist. So, you know, I've posted like my, I joke, my most viral post ever was like a dragon toilet paper holder because everybody <laughs> needs one for their guest bathroom, but it just, you know, I think it had a hundred thousand views and however many shares and that stuff. And I'm not going to say that sold any books, but it, you know, it's fun to interact with people who enjoy the same things that you enjoy and that that might lead them to checking out your books. You never know. I, I definitely sell a lot when I post the, the new books on there. I appreciate that. Um, I, I do actually have a, a, a question uh, from uh, from one of your fans sort of about um, how do you manage the um, sort of interest or drive from your fans to impact the content of your books. So I have a couple of questions from your fans here about are you returning to this character and when are we going to see these guys and um, you know how come you made this choice? You know, do you feel like you get that kind of feedback um, either through KDP or or on social media? To some extent, if a series sold well, is kind of motivator, and then to some extent too, a lot of it is just like, am I still excited about these characters? Can I see writing more stories about them? Can I see doing a spinoff in this series? Because sometimes I've had things that sold really well, but I'm like, well, that was the story ended how I wanted it to end, and it would feel weird to awkwardly stick on more just because that sold well. So I, I definitely I hear what folks say, what they ask for sometimes. You know, I'm like, well, I, I'm sorry, I just have no plans to do that. But I, you know, I keep it in my mind. Uh, I struggle because I always have new ideas and I always want to do new stuff. So sometimes it's rare, more rare for me to go back to old things and do a new installment. But it has happened. So if people, you know, say enough things like I, my first series, Emperor's Edge, um, the two heroes, you know, they finally, after starting as enemies, get together in the end. And I've had people request like, well, I want to see them with babies and you know, I want to see what happens next. So I'm keeping that in mind. I won't say no, you know, that, that one's a strong possibility that I'll go back and figure out one more story I can tell with these guys. I don't know if they'll be doing babies, but <laughs> it's a little hard with fantasy when you're killing the bad guys and fighting monsters and stuff to like be toting the little kid along <laughs> behind you. That would be an interesting <laughs> challenge though. So I, I do keep it in mind. I appreciate that. Um, do you feel like there's something that you, as a self-published author, is there something that you would tell your, your first book self um, that uh, we haven't spoken about yet, that you feel like now you know it, and at the time you, you wish you had had that information? I think that I didn't have the best covers. I've since redone them on that series. Uh, paid the big money to have like the model shoot with like, you know, the uh, bad, yeah, not bad guy, um, the hero and the heroine on the front, and they really look you know, coolly fantasy. Uh, for the longest time, I just had these yellow covers that look, somebody told me they look like ancient uh, Indian historical fiction or something. I was like, I don't think I'm quite hitting the cover tropes there for the genre or what's expected. So, um, but for the most part, I'm glad I didn't know as much with that first series. And I just wrote the series I wanted to write. It's actually been a fan favorite. I kind of luckily did a lot of things right, uh, just based on what I like as a reader. So I'm glad I wasn't thinking like, well, let's see what what's really working well in epic fantasy right now. It's knights and dragons and castles. I didn't have any of that kind of stuff in the first series. It was a sort of a steam era setting instead of the typical or common medieval fantasy setting. And so I, in some ways I'm glad I didn't know anything and I don't know if I would tell myself to change anything though. I think if I had had better covers early on, it would have been more successful early on uh, you know, I mentioned that when I made the first book free, that really helped things. But mm -hmm. I, it was sort of a struggle to sell those early copies. And what is the inspiration that keeps you, that keeps driving you? You know, you spoke a little bit about sort of you get the, the main characters first. Um, but is there something that, you know, really pushes you to either keep working in fantasy or, or just to continue writing, I mean, day after day? Well, at this point, it is the day job. So that's, of course, an inspiration. You, anytime the money starts falling off, you're like, oh, okay, maybe I need to write a little more, start working on the next series. 
So to some extent, just the simple day job kind of stuff, like, you know, you hear people say like, plumbers don't need to be inspired. They just go to work every day and plumb because that's what they have to do to pay the bills. But um, I am still an artist too. And I do have to, I mean, I don't have to, but it really helps if I'm inspired. Sometimes when you're deep in a series and this plot lines have gotten more complicated, it can be a little harder to make you start thinking like, oh, there's this new series idea I have. So I, I am just, at this point, I make myself finish the, the novel. And usually I've tried to finish the complete series before moving off to something else. It doesn't always work, but I, I don't, I don't let myself go, oh, I'm 30,000 in, 30, words into this. I'm going to go try something else, which is what I used to do. Um, mm. That's not a good way to finish novels. So whatever it takes. And sometimes if um, the plot is maybe not as exciting you as much as you wish, or you feel like you're to a point where you're kind of slogging, that's where I've realized maybe there's not enough conflict. Maybe there's not enough going on, you know, interesting between the characters. Uh, it's, you know, I, I think that maybe then you have to tinker a little bit with your outline or just, just take some time to think about what would be more fun, what would make this more fun to write, more fun to read. So I think if you're you're writing anything that's boring to you, it's going to be boring to the reader. So I'm, I always keep that in mind, too. I have a really short attention span, so I have to keep myself entertained. Um, but yeah, just it's become a habit at this point, a routine, so that there's a lot of power in that too. I, you know, you hear people recommend if just write 500 words a day or a thousand words a day, um, having it become a habit really helps you just sit down and, and do it. Mm -hmm. If you could change something about the self-publishing process, what would you change? I don't know. It's actually gotten pretty smooth right now. I would say, um, I think, Still, maybe like with Amazon KDP, I feel like the reporting could be a little more solid. I like the new mm -hmm. one, the beta reports for like the current mm -hmm. month. And I'm always like upset when they uh, announce the KDP payout because then you can't get the previous months. And, it, you know, right now you can get a nice pie chart. You can select four books. Like if you want to see how one specific series, how much I sold of that. And um, the reporting's got, it's definitely gotten better over the years, but I, I hope to see something like that in the historical reporting. So it's really easy to go back and, uh, you know, if like if you ever do get an offer from an agent or something, they want to know how many books did you sell of each in the series, you know, maybe between this date and this date. So uh, that's just some, you know, a little thing. It, it's really pretty there. I don't have too many complaints. Like it's it's a pretty good process. Things usually go off without a hitch. So um, we're, we've come a long way and it's, it's a great time to be a indie author. That's great. Um, we do have a little bit of time left, so I'm going to get to a couple more questions from our audience. Um, the first one, we actually have a, a pretty significant number of international uh, folks, uh, folks based outside of the U.S. who are joining us, and they would like to know if you're publishing in other languages. Well, that's kind of cool because I just signed a contract um, to with a German publisher and they're going to be doing my Dragon Blood series. And that's actually going to be like the first major oh, like, great. They're really committed. They want the whole series and they're planning to um, kind of almost the rapid release model where they're going to do like one every three months. And I think they're even going to put it in KDP Select in Germany so we can try to get the page reads and, you know, the little bit of extra um, that you get from that as far as visibility. Um, so that would be my first major going into another language. Um, as an indie author, you can certainly hire translators and have it done yourself. It seems to be quite expensive from uh, what I've heard from people who have done it. And, you know, I think we're getting to the point where it's a little easier to market in the other languages, but it's tough if you don't speak the language yourself. Um, I know uh, the Amazon ads are now available in Germany and, and some of the other countries, so that makes it a little easier to reach the audience. But, it, you know, I think if you happen to just knock it out of the park with a book and it's sticking and it's selling tons and, and you know you've kind of researched and they're like, oh, Italy, th those type of books are very popular, too, because you can't assume that, uh, you know, like I've heard uh, romance authors doing like Civil War, American Civil War stuff. They're like, these books don't sell in Europe. I, I don't know why they don't care about our Civil War. It's weird. So you have to research a little bit and see. Like uh, I, I found in Germany that the high fantasy, epic fantasy stuff seems to do quite well there, uh, even my English ones. So that was sort of a natural one to explore that. 
But um, if you're just doing it on your own, it's pretty expensive currently too, because you have to not only get it translated by an author who's basically kind of creating a new work, but then also pay for someone to edit the translation. So it's a pretty big investment, thousands of dollars typically for uh, per book. And if you're going to do a series, <laughs> there you go, times X. So uh, haven't done that yet myself. Sure. Um, I did have, uh, we will just, uh, we're coming to the, to the end of our time. Um, I wanted to give you just another two minutes or so. If there's anything else that you feel like, you know, really contributed to your success as a, as an indie author that we haven't talked about here that you feel like our audience would really benefit from. I, I think it's really boring, but I attribute a lot of success to just consistently writing and releasing books. It's very rare where I've gone more than a few months. Like I did play with a pen name for a while, but I, you know, I've almost always had something new. Even when I wasn't writing as quickly, I focused on that series and got, you know, two, three novels out a year in it, maybe two in the beginning. But um, just consistently putting stuff out and being there, you know, your readers start looking for you to see if you have anything new. And, you know, I know life gets in the way and sometimes authors just have to take a couple years off and that's how it is. But um, the more you can and you don't have to publish as often as I do. Maybe you publish one book a year and it comes out every February and that's just your day and people start looking for you around that time. So I, as boring it is as it is, I think that that's actually been a big part. And if you can plan to do that as an author, however makes sense with your schedule, if you're doing two a year, one a year, or if you're going to be, a, you know, if you're a fast writer and do one a month, it's probably better to kind of trickle them out consistently rather than like power through, do a whole series and then disappear for two years. And I mm -hmm. think that really helps build up a fan base. That's really good advice. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up today's event. Um, just a reminder for our audience uh, that uh, today's event uh, will be, uh, it has been recorded um, and it will be posting it to our help pages and our Kindle Direct Publishing YouTube channel. Um, if you enjoyed today's event, which I sincerely hope that you did, Lindsay has been a fantastic uh, interviewee um, sharing really practical advice and um, some great uh, anecdotes as well about writing in, in sci-fi and fantasy. Um, if you enjoyed this, enjoyed this event, uh, please uh, check out our upcoming sessions. We're, we're doing these weekly. Uh, we have one coming up with CJ Cooper, Melissa Foster, and Aleron Kong uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. And then Elizabeth Hunter uh, is, is following that. Register uh, directly from our webinars help page where you signed up for today's event. Um, the link to this recording and the upcoming sessions will be included in tomorrow's follow-up email. Um, I want to say a really special thank you to, to Lindsay. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and, and sharing all of this fantastic information. Um, we really uh, enjoyed uh, your, your time, uh, and I hope that it was fun for you as well. It was great. I really appreciate you guys having me. And thank you to everyone who listened live or if you're checking that later, appreciate that too. I um, hope something was helpful and have a great day. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody. And as always, happy publishing.